a big impact examining the effects of if forced arbitration will come to order. The Seventh Amendment to the Constitution guarantees the right to a jury trial. However, for tens of millions of Americans, this constitutional right is an empty promise. Instead of having their day in court, people are forced into arbitration by the fine print buried deep in employment contracts, product manuals, and terms of service. I'd like to turn to a brief video featuring three individuals who were denied their day in court as a result of forced arbitration clauses that they didn't know very little, if anything, about. Please proceed. So what is forced arbitration? Basically, it means you're giving up your right to take a dispute to court. Um, this is a constitutional right you have, and uh, you're giving it up even before you know that there's a dispute. Arbitration clauses are typically buried in the fine print of a product manual or websites. Most people don't even realize they are agreeing to them. The used car John Purs bought seven years ago has hardly ever left the garage. There was an engine problem the dealer first failed and then refused to fix. Then Purs found to his dismay he'd agreed to binding arbitration and couldn't sue. I didn't even know what an arbitration agreement was. I was really beside myself that we've lost our right to court. I'm a lieutenant commander in the Navy Reserves and a federal employee, was fired on the eve of my deployment to Afghanistan and later forced to arbitrate my discrimination claim when I returned home. In November 2012, I received orders to deploy to Afghanistan for 12 months. On my last day of work, my colleagues greeted me with a standing ovation. At noon, BLB held a surprise party in my honor. Around 4.45 that same afternoon, I was called into a meeting in the HR department where I was fired and told my position would not be available to me after my deployment. Jasmine Wilson and I am a former Tesla employee. If I didn't sign the arbitration, then there was no opportunity for me to maintain or continue with the job. I was cat called, I had a racial slur shouted at me. I had to give myself a pep talk every single day to go to work. I dreaded it, yet I needed my paycheck. I was often blamed for the harassment I received. I was retaliated against. They used the weapon of forced arbitration to avoid public accountability. Forced arbitration is pervasive. It affects more than 60 million workers. An estimated 825 million consumer arbitration agreements were in force in 2018, a number that undoubtedly has gone up since then. If you've activated a cell phone, signed up for a credit card, bought a mattress, television, countless products, you likely agreed to arbitrate any future disputes with the manufacturer or service provider. Don't be embarrassed if you're just learning that you likely waived your constitutional right to bring a claim in court. You're part of the 90% of American consumers who use popular products and had no idea they'd signed up for forced arbitration. All of us, quote, agree to forced arbitration when we click that button or check that box, accepting terms of service. We may have no idea we're agreeing to this process when we sign up. The rules governing arbitration often limit the information victims can get from corporations, making it even more difficult to prove their claims. The process is overseen by arbitrators who can be biased in favor of one side or the other, usually corporations, because they want to ensure a steady pipeline of future work. Those arbitrators aren't bound by precedent, and their decisions are only subject to limited judicial review. The problems are compounded by the secretive nature of this process. Nowhere where was this troubling combination more pronounced than in cases of sexual assault and sexual harassment. For years, predators like Roger Ailes preyed upon women without fear because they or their employees, pardon me, employers would hide behind confidential arbitration proceedings to sweep abuse under the rug. Thankfully, that's no longer the case. Brave survivors like Gretchen Carlson with us today, thank you for joining us, step forward to break this cycle of abuse. As a result of her unrelenting advocacy in this committee's de de determination to do something on a bipartisan basis, the ending forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment was signed into law by President Biden in March of 2022. As the name suggests, this law pro prohibits forced arbitration in cases of sexual assault or sexual harassment. While this marked a significant achievement, there's more to be done. We'll hear from witness Joan Grace, Joanne Grace, how forced arbitration is used to cover up illegal age discrimination, an issue of great interest to the senator from South Carolina. The same is true of racial discrimination, abuse in nursing care, and countless other harms. Joanne and others like, their, like her deserve their day in court. That's what the Constitution promises. 
That's what the Congress should provide. I want to thank Ranking Member Graham and his staff for working with us on this bipartisan basis to select today's witnesses. And before I uh, turn the microphone over to Senator Graham, I want to congratulate South Carolina and Iowa for their terrific basketball experience over the last two weeks. Senator Graham. Well, thank you. It was a heck of a ball game. Uh, Caitlin Clark was a phenomenal college athlete. Personally, I'm glad she's going to the pros. <laughs> <laughs> she beat us last year, but we, we came back. So it was a great game. Um, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to level the playing field. Uh, <clears throat> I co-sponsored the bill with Senator Gilderbrand about sexual harassment and sexual assault uh, employment contracts. When you go to work for somebody, you sign an employment contract, pretty much take it or leave it. And most of these employment contracts require mandatory arbitration, binding arbitration is not really a level playing field. We learned that. In the areas of sexual harassment and sexual assault, I think most Americans believe that you shouldn't sign away your rights to have your day in court. Uh, that's just too personally important. And we passed a law to say you cannot require through binding arbitration and employment contract, you cannot deny the employee their day in court. And Ms. Carlson was instrumental in that. So now we have the Protecting Older Americans Act. Um, what's that all about? A lot of people are discriminated in, in the workplace, in my view, because of their age, because it's just so much cheaper to have a younger employee. And <clears throat> we've seen that, you know, uh, there's articles about CVS and other companies that routinely engage in these kind of practices where an older employee is under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of harassment, and the next thing you know, uh, they're terminated. So what I want to do is to make sure that if you feel like you've been discriminated based on your age, that you can have your day in court. It's still the burden's on you to prove you were. The company in, or the individual involved will have plenty of defenses but I just think forced arbitration in that situation uh, doesn't serve the public interest. And I hope after this hearing, we can have a vote on protecting Older Americans Act that would do away with binding arbitration and employment contracts. And finally, arbitration is okay. If you're in seeking advice, uh, you're in the investment uh, business trying to you know, go get some advice for investment. It's a business relationship. Two companies want to agree to arbitration. There's a level playing field. That's not my problem. There is plenty of space in the American economy for arbitration. But what we've seen is these employment contracts pretty much are written to the advantage of the employer and in areas like sexual harassment, age discrimination, in a few other areas, it's gotten out of hand, and I want to level the playing field. So thank you for having this here. Thanks, Senator Graham. We both agreed on the four witnesses who I'll now, now introduce, Gretchen Carlson, no stranger to the committee, and welcome back, former CBS News and Fox News journalist and vocal advocate for women's rights, curbing the abuse of forced arbitration and non-disclosure agreements. Her 2016 sexual harassment lawsuit against Roger Ailes was one of the first high-profile cases of the Me Too movement. In 2019, she co-founded Lift Our Voices, a nonprofit organization to advocate for a ban on NDAs and forced arbitration in employment contracts. Miriam Gillis, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Did I get it right? Law professor at Benjamin Cardozo School of Law. Professor Gillis specializes in class actions and aggregate litigation and has written extensively on arbitration, previously testified before our committee. Welcome back. Victor Schwartz, co-chair of the Public Policy Group at Schock, Hardy, and Bacon. Mr. Schwartz served as law professor and dean of the University of Cincinnati College of Law before his current position. He's previously testified before the committee, and we welcome him. Joanne Grace of Columbiana, Ohio, has served her community in a variety of nursing homes since 1976, including as a floor nurse, supervisor, manager, and the Director of Nursing Services. Thanks for joining us today. 
I'm going to swear in the witnesses and that each will have five minutes for an opening statement, then the question uh, period, five-minute five rounds for each of the senators. I'd ask the witnesses to please rise. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Answer the affirmative. I do. All right. Thank you. Ms. Carlson, you're first. Thank you so much. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about my experience with forced arbitration and the work I'm doing to make workplaces safer in America. In 2016, I found the courage to sue one of the most powerful men in the world, former Fox News chair and CEO Roger Ailes for sexual harassment. Toughest decision of my life, but after they fired me, I said to myself, if I don't do it, who will? My story certainly made headlines, but it could have easily been swept under the rug like countless others because of that forced arbitration clause in my contract. No one starts a new job expecting harassment, I know I didn't, and few people can walk away from a job because of the fine print. I don't care who you are, most people have no idea what forced arbitration means. In my case, it showed up in my last contract with Fox. I was told not to worry because it was, quote, becoming the way of the world. I could not have imagined how true that would prove to be. Employees have no idea that signing on the dotted line, accepting a forced arbitration clause can strip them of their rights for future justice. Back then, I could have never known that my story would help propel Congress to start examining forced arbitration in a meaningful way. Thanks to other courageous women, to the members of this committee, and to other champions in Congress hailing from both sides of the aisle. Survivors of sexual misconduct can now seek justice. Witnessing the president sign the ending forced arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act two years ago was one of the proudest moments of my life. Courage is contagious, and this new law is already having significant impact. Kristen Tiger, a bartender at a country club who alleged she was sexually harassed by multiple members, was able to bring a harassment lawsuit against her employer last year. And even though her employer tried to still silence her by filing a motion to compel arbitration, the request was denied because of the new law. A judge in Texas also declined to grant Blaze Media's motion to dismiss last year after employee Sidney Watson alleged harassment in the workplace. Watson's case can also continue in court thanks to the new law. While I feel endless gratitude towards this committee for restoring the rights of sexual misconduct survivors like these, I'm now sure than ever before that all Americans deserve this right. It's why I'm a champion of the new bipartisan forced arbitration bill, the Protecting Older Americans Act, co-sponsored by Senators Graham and Gillibrand with endorsements by Chair Durbin and Senator Grassley too. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Booker, for leading the effort to introduce the Ending Forced Arbitration of Race Discrimination Act. These bills give Americans a choice about whether or how to seek accountability, a choice that should not be made by companies or the government. You're going to hear from Joanne about age discrimination in a moment, but let me tell you about two former Tesla employees, Jasmine Wilson and Kabaru Awalan. They reported racist behavior at their California Tesla's plant, Graffiti that read KKK and the N-word, but no action was taken when they went to HR and they were forced into arbitration. Stephanie Weaver's grandmother went missing at a nursing home after being left unattended, and when the home called her to come look for her grandmother, she found her grandmother's dismembered body had been eaten by an alligator in a nearby pond. Stephanie fought all the way to the South Carolina Court of Appeals after the home tried to force her into arbitration. If your grandmother can be eaten by an alligator because she wasn't properly cared for, and a major employer like Tesla can be accused of rampant race discrimination, and in both cases, forced arbitration eliminates justice, something must be terribly wrong with our system. For the naysayers out there, the US Chamber claimed all hell would break loose if you let women file their assault and harassment cases in court. There'd be a slew of new cases and companies would go out of business. But none of that has happened. Instead, survivors are simply being empowered with a choice. After my story at Fox News, a close friend said to me, 
Gretchen, something good is going to come of this. At the time, I couldn't see it. But something great has come of all of this. Thank you for holding this hearing. And I hope when you consider the horrible stories currently being allowed to flourish within the secrecy of forced arbitration, you will agree that all Americans deserve this choice. Thank you. And thank you for stepping up. America is better because you had the courage to step up and say things which were painful. Thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Professor Gillis. Chairman Durbin, uh, Ranking Member Graham, distinguished members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, thank you for inviting me to speak today about the harmful effects of forced arbitration clauses that are imposed on all of us in take-it-or-leave-it contracts that shunt cases out of our public courts and into secret one-on-one -on -one arbitrations. And I say all of us because as we sit here today in this room, everybody in this room is subject to a forced arbitration clause. Everybody in this country is subject to a forced arbitration clause in some aspect of their life. As Senator Durbin noted, to use a credit card to apply for a job, to open a checking account, to use a cell phone to put your mom in a nursing home, you effectively have to sign away your freedom to decide for yourself how to exercise your rights. Forced arbitration takes that power, that agency, away from each of us and hands it over to powerful corporations. What this means is that when there's a forced arbitration clause in effect, Americans often have no way of getting justice under federal laws that would otherwise be enforced in court, whether they be consumer protection, antitrust, privacy, or discrimination laws. Because forced arbitration essentially replaces the laws that this body enacts with private legislation written by corporations into the fine print of contracts that nobody reads and nobody can negotiate. One way of grasping the enormity of the problem we've come to talk to you about today is to consider some recent cases where there was no forced arbitration clause in effect and to think about the injustices that would still be happening if those cases had been blocked by forced arbitration. I think we've all heard about the massive antitrust case <clears throat> brought against the real estate industry, which recently resulted in a jury verdict in favor of home purchasers and a settlement that promises to change the way Americans buy homes by reducing commissions and opening up competition among agents. It's total happenstance, senators, that most real estate brokers simply didn't impose arbitration on their clients, because if they had, this historic and industry-changing settlement would never have come about. And since we've been talking about the Protecting Older Americans Act, I want to tell you about another case. In 2016, a group of Hewlett Packard employees sued, alleging, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> alleging the company violated the ADA by terminating them because of their age. Now, about 140 of the laid, laid off workers signed releases that included forced arbitration clauses, while another 320 refused to sign. Those ARB free workers were allowed to continue in court, where last week the judge uh, agreed to a settlement for $18 million, the highest per plaintiff settlement ever recovered in an age discrimination suit, while the workers who had the misfortune of signing releases with forced arbitration clauses are out of luck. That makes no sense. I could go on and on. There are many examples like this, but the point is simply this. Congress enacts laws to protect Americans. Many of those laws rely for their enforcement on courageous individuals bringing lawsuits challenging harmful and sometimes long-standing policies and practices. Forced arbitration denies victims the right to bring such challenges, and it denies all of us the ability to know what's going on in the marketplace and in the workplace. And for what? Why has this unjust regime of forced arbitration developed? Well, it's not because, as the chamber would tell us, that it's because forced arbitration is cheaper, faster, or easier. That's not it. If it were, companies wouldn't have to force us to do it, right? We'd want to do it. Instead, companies impose forced arbitration to squelch cases and to immunize themselves from public accountability. And I think the evidence of this true motivation is now glaringly obvious in the recent phenomenon of mass arbitration, uh, in which victims simultaneously file thousands of individual arbitrations, basically forcing corporations to actually face claims of wrongdoing and make good on their contractual promises to pay the cost of arbitrating large numbers of single-file claims. 
No surprise, I think, that just about every company hit with a mass arbitration has gone running to court seeking relief from their own contracts. Also no surprise that the Chamber of Commerce characterizes mass arbitration as extortion. Meanwhile, federal judges faced with these cases have called it poetic justice. Here's the point, however you, whatever you think about mass arb, res the resistance that these companies have to individually arbitrating these cases after unilaterally forcing these provisions on their workers and consumers makes clear that forced arbitration was never about fairness or efficiency, but about suppressing worker and consumer cases. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Professor Schwartz. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me. You want to? Oh, thank you. Yay. Um, today is uh, April 9th, and I just mention one personal note. <clears throat> it was my dad's birthday. He died when I was 10. So I don't want to goof up too much today in case he's sure you hanging around somewhere. Uh, there's a lot of myths and truths about arbitration. But a couple of things that I wanted to mention, uh, because I had a minister named Albert Sickley. And he taught me something not in context is pretext. And you have to put arbitration in context with litigation, which I know about. I've lived it for 50 years. And I do write a case book that a lot of people have seen, Prosser Wade and Schwartz. Uh, the cost of arbitration is far less than litigation. Uh, we have data that show that. It is much cheaper. There is, in litigation, a lot of delay. I mean real delay. It may take a year more than a year to your case is heard, where with arbitration, you get heard right away. And that's an important, an important thing. Um, claimants benefit because it's simpler. You can not have to go to court. Learned Hand said, after disease, nothing is worse than being in litigation. And I know what it is on both sides. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to disrupt your family, uh, and that is a definite benefit uh, because you work on your own time. The, we'll submit data to show that the amount you receive in litigation is uh, not less than you would uh, in arbitration or the reverse, uh, not at all. And I mentioned uh, the disruption that occurs with your life in litigation. It's just not good. And then getting an attorney. Employing, employment cases, it's almost impossible to get a plaintiff's attorney today unless the contingency fee is uh, very, very substantial. A $200,000 case, you're not going to get a, a plaintiff's attorney unless he or she wants to volunteer. Not on the contingency fee system. And it's proper. They end up getting $100 an hour, and they don't want that. So you can't get an attorney, and all you've got is arbitration itself. There are a lot of things said about pre-dispute arbitration. There can be debates about it, but this is just uh, this little fellow's point of view. Um, they, in most instances, it's really not forced. If you want to buy a phone, a lot of the phone companies require you to sign an arbitration agreement. Not all. There often is an alternative. Or you can say, hey, I don't want to do it at all. Um, sometimes the, it's small print and a big, long contract. But if it's too buried and it can't be seen, courts will deem that unconscionable. They have the power to do it, and they do it. So if the agreement has things that are just improper, state courts hold them un, uh, improper under unconscionability. Um, about confidence. You can tell any public official about your agreement. You can tell them the result. Uh, gag orders are strictly struck down by courts. And since this committee has held hearings, it's been helpful because more state courts are doing that. Um, and that is a important thing. Some people say, we'll do it post-arbitration. After, I mean, post-dispute, that doesn't work because each side tries to rig it in its own 
um, way. And businesses don't prevail at a greater risk, at a greater length with arbitration versus litigation. And I'd be very happy to take your questions. I see the orange light. And for 50 years, I have never gone beyond the orange light. So I've kept it up. Thank you. Well, you're the first witness who can say that. I thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> at, at this point, uh, Ms. Grace. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham. Oh, I'm sorry. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished committee members, it is truly an honor to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my story on how I was wrongfully terminated because of my age and how my former employer is using forced arbitration to steal my rights, my voice, and even my dignity. I started my career as a registered nurse in 1976. I've dedicated my whole life to others. After working hard for almost 50 years as a floor nurse, a supervisor, a manager, and a director, my healthcare system was acquired by Stewart Health System. Shortly thereafter, I became a patient advocate. I loved being a patient advocate because it allowed me to speak up when a patient wasn't being heard. This is the same person, this is the same purpose for which I am here today, to speak for those who are being silenced with forced arbitration. When Stewart hired a new director of nursing in 2020, the overt ageism started. What was a second home to me became a hostile work environment. Older employees were being replaced by younger employees. At least once a week, this director of nursing would say something to me like, why do you want to keep working at your age? Or why aren't you retiring? She openly talked about my age and even a medical condition in meetings just to embarrass me. HR dismissed my discrimination. You know what HR told me? They called me an old warrior. Joanne, you're an old warrior. Old. Old. Why would an HR representative feel so brazen and so shameless as to outright call me old to my face? When I was out of work with COVID-19, Stewart posted a new supervisor job online. The job description made it very clear to me that it was my position, just with a different title. Two days after I returned to work, one position was, quote, reduced. One position. It was mine. Because my position legally needed to be filled, the hospital hired for that supervisor position someone in their 20s who did not even meet the minimum experience requirements for a supervisor. My reduction was a lie to force me out. I was devastated. In getting rid of more experienced nurses like myself, the hospital was putting patient safety at risk. I hired an attorney to sue Stewart for age discrimination. It is not about the money. I love being a nurse. I want to protect other nurses and keep patients safe. I hope that my lawsuit can effectuate that change. Stewart moved to hire my lawsuit by forcing us into arbitration agreement, into an arbitration agreement. Even though I had never signed any forced arbitration agreement, um, they, um, my employer, pointed to my name on an Excel list as having attended a training about arbitration. I didn't even attend that training. They said that by continuing to work after that training session, I lost my right to hold them accountable in court. The wickedness did not stop there. This so-called forced arbitration agreement further rigs this process by allowing me only to call one witness from Stewart and limits me to calling on and asking for 25 documents. In court, I could depose the director of nursing, the HR representative, those decision makers, and all the witnesses that witnessed my age discrimination. In a forced binding arbitration, I can only call one witness. They claim this, art, this agreement allows the employer to pick the pool of potential arbitrators, which is mainly defense-oriented attorneys. This means that a defense-oriented attorney is going to decide my case. If I somehow make it through this rigged process and win, no one will know, and no change can ever happen. 
as long as Congress allows companies to sweep accountability under the rug, they will continue to do just that. I hope you now understand why an HR representative felt so brazen and shameless to call me old. The ability to use forced arbitration empowers companies to violate the law while hurting nurses and patients. As more older Americans remain in the workforce, our rights need to be protected. Older workers should not be forced into retirement nor into forced arbitration. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Lindsey Graham. Committee members, thank you for listening to how allowing forced arbitration really has destroyed my dignity. Legislation is needed to end this practice and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Grace, thank you for being here. On behalf of an institution filled with seasoned warriors, uh, we stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with you in this effort. Uh, and thank you for telling your story for all of the country to hear. It's a very important. I take it from what you said, you never signed, checked a box, or in any way indicated that you were part of any forced arbitration agreement. No, I did that. And in fact, I, um, as, as part of management at the director level, through part of Steward Health uh, acquisition, um, I saw other people go who were older. They signed the arbitration paperwork. At the end, when they were terminated, in, in uh, return for a, um, some kind of uh, monetary um, agreement that they can receive. It was not, I never signed that, and I would never advocate for anybody to sign that. Mr. Schwartz, uh, this is a legendary moment in my life. Now I've discovered a man who is the author of Prosser on Torts, a, book, a, a textbook which I purchased in law school at Georgetown quite a few years ago. Uh, I was impressed not only with the contents, but by the weight of that book. I carried it around all year, uh, trying to learn from it, and I salute you for being the co-author of one of the most famous legal textbooks in America. I'm glad to learn you, you did this. Uh, may I ask you, following up on the question with Miss Grace, Oh, I just want to thank you, sir. I can tell you one thing about that book that you may not know. If you put it on the floor in your kitchen, you can reach the top shelf. A lot of people do not know that. <laughs> That's good practical advice. <laughs> Recently, a company called Roku, which is a streaming service, updated its dispute resolution terms. I pulled out the uh, contract which they offer to people who wanted their services. Despite not providing a description of what terms changed, the company wouldn't allow you to continue using a Roku device to stream your favorite shows unless you agreed to the terms on this contract. Assuming a user took time to read them, and I, they're pretty simple, they say, any disputes between us, meaning the consumer and the company, will be settled by binding arbitration, paren, meaning we both give up the right to go to court, end of paren. Let's walk through what it takes to opt out of that provision in their contract. You cannot opt out by email. Instead, you have 30 days to mail a letter to Roku's general counsel. The letter must include the name of each person opting out, their contact information, the specific Roku product models owned, the software in the product, the software in the product, the services that issue the email address you use to set up your Roku account, and if applicable, a copy of your purchase receipt. Opt-out notices submitted in any other way, including email, are considered ineffective. When you hear Miss Grace's experience where they're trying to impute or infer that she signed up for arbitration and you see the rigmarole you have to go through at Roku to get out of it, Mr. Schwartz, do you think that this is a, a contract that should be honored? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, you're... At could you repeat the question, please? It's a long question. Right. I'm asking about the Roku company that has a forced arbitration agreement, and to opt out of it, you need to send an elaborate uh, number of communications specified in a manner that they accept. And you've heard Ms. Grace sitting next to you talk about what she went through, where it was inferred that she had signed this agreement. 
Can you comment on that aspect of forced arbitration? I think that um, forced arbitration, some people call it forced, but <clears throat> in that situation with age, there, it's, there should be an opt-out. Uh, age situations are different than your regular purchase of a product. Um, and um, I think that it's an area where uh, carefully drawn rules should regulate such contracts. And in fact, in general, I would say to you, Senator, that this is an area where it's hard to find rules in the abstract. Having federal regulation of these arbitration agreements, I think is a sound step to do, rather than live it to the whim of state courts, because some of the agreements may be unfair. They may be unfair with uh, Ms. Grace, um, but it's very hard to do that in the abstract without uh, specific knowledge of the specific contract. So I'm suggesting a consideration of having regulation at the federal level of these agreements, especially in areas of controversy like age, military, children, nursing homes. Thank you. Senator Graham. That idea of, you know, some kind of regulatory scheme, uh, we'll, we'll see where that takes us. I think it's a good suggestion to the committee. Uh, Ms. Grace, um, <clears throat> did you find it more of a common practice that the older you got, the more scrutiny you were under in terms of uh, your employer? I did, sir. Uh, in the prior hospital system that I was at before it was bought. What's the difference between your salary and the person that they hired to take your job? Much less because okay. they hire by experience um, and um, my salary was a, as a patient advocate, um, $38, $38 an hour, which is good money for a, a nurse. Um, that supervisor probably who took on my job probably was making 25. Okay. Uh, Professor Giles, is, is uh, <clears throat> in the age discrimination area, is it one of the common themes here that replacing an older employee with a younger employer saves money? Yes, yeah. because they believe, it's been a long time belief in healthcare that- no, I'm longer, just talking about Professor Giles, I'm, I'm sorry. Pardon? Yeah, it's, I'm directing this question to Professor. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, my, my bad. Excuse me. But, I, but I'm gonna continue with what uh, Joanne has just told us. Yes, I mean, the idea is that uh, younger workers can come in more cheaply. Uh, seniority, you know, as many of us know, um, each each promotion gets you more and more money. So if you can get rid of those expensive, older, experienced workers um, and call it sort of a worker reshuffle um, and hire younger workers with less experience, you can do so more cheaply. Uh, the idea of going to court, <clears throat> the burden is still on the plaintiff, right? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, let's not pretend here that uh, getting rid of forced arbitration means that everybody's going to walk into court and get a check, you know, once they walk into court. Judicial, the federal judicial system has tremendous amounts of tools for federal judges to use to make sure that the cases before them are valid, are meritorious, and they use them on a daily basis. I think Rule 11 is one of those tools, right? Well, that's one of those tools when we think that something has gone awry, but I would say that Rule 8, that tells us that, you know, you have to be able to plead your case um, in a way that uh, shows that there's an actual there there. Um, th that's a meaningful rule. Rule 12b-6, which gives Victor the opportunity to represent his clients by seeking to dismiss claims that they think uh, lack legal merit. It's a ton of stuff that lawyers uh, and judges do to ensure that the system of laws operates the way that we want it to. But forced arbitration basically says, let's just forget all that and forget all those cases um, and, and shunt them into a private system. Uh, so, uh, so I think that that's, that's the real problem here. Uh, Ms. Grace uh, indicated that she could only call one witness in the arbitration setting. Is that common? Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, you were still asking me? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, so for our, our, the arbitral providers really limit discovery. That is one of the ways in which they can promise to their repeat clients that they will not have to spend very much money and not have many of their uh, corporate executives have to sit down for depositions. So yes, I have, my understanding is that very uh, tight limits on discovery. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chairman, uh, I think the Protecting Older Americans Act, uh, um, I hope the committee will take it up and we, we can pass it. And to Mr. Schwartz, I think your, I, your idea about some federal guidelines in this area make, make some sense to me. And I'd like to continue this discussion. There is a place for arbitration. I'm not against arbitration as a general concept. I just think the idea of leveling the playing field and the kind of services you seek matter. The more sophisticated the service, uh, you know, uh, the more level the playing field would be, in my view. So at the end of the day, basic consumer engagements, uh, we need to make sure that people are not left out to dry when it comes to sexual harassment, age discrimination, and other areas of our lives, that people have a chance to have their day in court. But generally speaking, ha having arbitration um, is a good thing. I think it, it is cheaper. It is more efficient but there are circumstances where it really doesn't render justice. And that's what I'm looking for, is try to find that balance. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Graham. Senator Whitehouse? Thanks very much, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here and for supporting this, I think, important cause. Um, the chairman mentioned the important role of the Seventh Amendment just as part of our Constitution, but you can go well back before the Seventh Amendment to Blackstone's commentaries, speaking about how the jury, the glory of the English legal system, which we inherited, um, had the benefit of being a bastion against uh, the influence of the powerful and more wealthy, he used the word citizens, now I would say forces, because uh, our most powerful and wealthy influences right now tend to be corporate. Um, and so you can see the reason why corporate America would like to get out from the jury system. It's the place where you can't fix things. You can come to Congress and you can shower money around and send lobbyists all over the place. You can help presidents get elected and get favored treatment in the Oval Office. But you try to pull stunts with a jury and you go to jail for jury tampering. And we've seen over and over again cases in which an honest courtroom has been the solution to lies and to bullying that were protected in the political space. So there's a lot going on when the Supreme Court tries to disable Americans' right to trial by jury and allow corporations to seize it and shunt them to uh, binding arbitration. Uh, Professor Willis, this has had particular impact in the area of the high volume, low dollar frauds that are really only economically answerable by class actions. Could you talk a little bit about how the power to take away jury rights and force citizens into mandatory ar arbitration has uh, impacted the ability of corporations to get away with uh, low dollar, high volume fraud? Sure. Um, I mean, and this is the very reason we're here, right? Because um, as the CFPB found in its 2015 study of forced arbitration, most arbitration provisions uh, 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 combine a class action ban, right? So the idea is we would prefer these companies to say uh, not to be uh, responsible or accountable for, as you describe it, Senator, um, small per plaintiff injuries. So we can sort of spread the pain around to lots and lots of uh, individual Americans. And uh, most of them are never going to individually arbitrate those claims because it's simply not worth it to do so, right? If you and yeah. I. Let's say you add a, 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 a fake $15 fee. Yeah onto all of your customers' bills, you might get some calls complaining, yeah. in which case you reverse it. 
And most with the others, you just know. bill them, but nobody yeah. will stop you because it's not worth anybody exactly. to go and hire a lawyer and litigate over a $15 fee for them. But if you have 2 million customers, that's $30 million that exactly. you just uh, exactly. robbed from the public. Yeah. And this is why the, um, the adopters of Rule 23 in 1966 decided that there needed to be a procedural pathway to allow small dollar claims into the court system. Otherwise, corporations could run roughshod over all of our rights. And as you say, most of us would never even notice uh, the $15 overcharge. And so it's really important to, uh, to see that right now, companies could be doing so many things, uh, so many illegal things along the edges um, that are simply falling through the legal cracks because class actions are impossible to bring where a forced arbitration clause is in effect. And compared to the um, elaborate and well-developed procedural and substantive provisions that make sure a courtroom is fair, mm -hmm. uh, how has it worked out in arbitration chambers? Well, that's a complicated question, but I'll give you, I'll give you a few uh, bullet points. Um, First off, and I just want to disagree with my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Victor Schwartz, arbitration fees are dramatically higher than court fees. They're just higher. Um, arbitration, arbitrators are paid a daily rate of somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 an hour. We don't, we don't have to, individuals do not have to pay judges to hear their cases. Uh, the arbitral provider is picked by the very company that the worker or the consumer is complaining about. So I just want you to think most of you in this room are lawyers. Um, imagine if you could just pick your judge, right? So the repeat player bias there should not surprise us. Um, third, as you mentioned, Senator Whitehouse, the arbitration clauses um, that we're seeing uh, prohibit all forms of collective action, right? So any form of collectivization, which means that for most people, that's, it's simply not viable. Um, we've talked about this with, uh, with Ms. Grace. The rules of the arbitral bodies limit discovery and other attempts to obtain evidence. They do not employ the evidentiary rules and have very limited appellate rights, as in almost zero appellate rights. Um, so for all of these reasons, we're talking about systems that um, are, were created by companies uh, and look exactly like what a company would create, a system that protects them and doesn't protect the rest of us. Mr. Chairman, I just add that what, back when I was Attorney General, one of my Attorney General colleagues brought an action against one of these arbitration offices and caused them to shut down because they had been so uh, crooked in their manipulation of the outcomes against the individuals and in favor of, in effect, their corporate clients. So there's a long record here, and I appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Cotton. Thank you all for appearing today. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, I, I have a series of questions I want to ask you uh, just to establish some baseline facts about arbitration. But since the professor just mentioned you by name for disagreement, would you like to respond yes, to her disagreement you. with you that arbitration, I think she said arbitration fees are higher than court fees? I'll submit the uh, rules of the American Arbitration Association. Uh, the payment is not more than $300. And there's one way a fee sharing. If you win the arbitration, your all your fees are reimbursed. I will submit the rules to the committee, and I'd be happy to send a copy to the professor so she can look at the rules of the American Arbitration and, and Association. That, you said three hundred dollars. Is that three hundred dollars a day? N uh, no, it's a, a, an immediate fee. That's it. Okay. And I will submit the rules to the committee. The, the rules don't lie, if, and. Uh, but people can speculate about them. Take a look at them, Senator. Okay, thank you. Now I wanna go through uh, these questions that I have just to establish some baseline facts. The point of having a court system, Mr. Schwartz, is so that people who have been wrong can have a fair and efficient system here and decide their claims, correct? That's right. Um, are state and federal courts backlogged and overburdened? Yes, they are. a matter of cases right now? Before COVID, they were backed up. Now it's about 18 months until you can have your case heard. Meanwhile, you have medical expenses, you have other uh, situations where you can't work, uh, where arbitration can be heard much more quickly, sir. Okay. Um, is it true that arbitration is typically faster at resolving those claims and taking the, some of those claims to the court system? We can submit information to you. It's much, much faster. Is it true Courts that are delayed in jury picking. And I want to mention something about 
uh, class actions because this committee uh, should look into how class actions are, are used. In many situations, the lawyers end up with quite a bit of money and the members of the class don't. And it's, I see this every year where they're willing to settle and frankly, sometimes defense lawyers settle because they want to get rid of the case. And the ones who get the benefit are the lawyers and not the victims who are supposed to be helped in the class. So this committee looks at different things. Uh, class actions should have their original purpose of Rule 23 and not be abused. Plaintiffs in arbitration can recover the same kinds and amounts of damages that they would get in a court? The, we will submit information that it, it, that is true. Stanford study shows the amount of damages are, don't vary between arbitration and court. So academic studies show that the amount of recovery um, does not vary, is not materially different between a court and an arbitration. Stanford study, which is respectable, shows that. Is it true that arbitration is more flexible than the court system? For example, that arbitration can be can occur anytime and anywhere that's convenient for both parties rather than a courtroom on the judge's schedule? For, regu for people with regular jobs, it is much better with people with families. Uh, dragged into court is no, is no fun. Uh, this can be done at a nearby place where people live uh, at a time that's convenient for their job. Um, and so I appreciate that question. And, and claimants in arbitration, they can have a lawyer, they can d get discovery, they can get relevant materials necessary to prove their claim. Yeah, the you, discovery is lengthy, uh, costly, and disruptive of one's life. That's for sure, because I've been <laughs> involved um, that for years, and I sure. I don't want to be the, on the wrong side of that one. There's also been a lot of uh, talk about uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, or secrecy agreements, uh, just to be clear that arbitration agreements and non-disclosure agreements are not the same thing, correct? That's correct. Okay. Non-disclosure agreements are a separate piece, and they're used in litigation when you settle a case. You sign NDAs. But uh, you can't muzzle somebody from giving the results of arbitration or complaining about it. Okay. Um, my time is almost up, but it sounds like from your testimony, you believe that arbitration is, is less expensive and faster than federal courts, that claimants tend to do just as well as they do in court. They can make their own decision whether to publicize or talk about their claims, um, and that in general, they're going to do better based on your earlier testimony too from relative to what they would in court versus what the lawyer can take of their cut. Is all that correct? From a practical reason. And it is important to remember that with many of these disputes today, you can't get a lawyer. So an employee who has a case that's $100,000, lots of luck for them getting a lawyer because the contingency fee system doesn't provide an adequate reward for the plaintiff's lawyer. The, it's either arbitration or nothing. It's not comparing it to the court. I've made that point in my testimony, but I think it's important that it be and, in the record, sir. And, and this is why, as the Supreme Court has acknowledged, that federal law and policy has generally been favorable towards arbitration going back almost 100 years now to the passage, passage of the Arbitration Act. Surprisingly, it's an area where the court's been in agreement. Um, you know, they fight each other quite a bit, but in this area, uh, they've respected the Federal Arbitration Act. Thank you. Senator Klobuchar. Um, thank you very much, uh, Senator Durbin, and thank you to uh, the witnesses today. Um, I'm going to focus, uh, I welcome uh, Gretchen Carlson from the great state of Minnesota, um, and I'm going to focus my questions today on antitrust, um, and Mr. Uh, Schwartz, I wrote a book on this that also can help you step on it to uh, get to the top shelf. Um, I'm going to ask Ms. Gillis uh, questions on this front. Um, because I think it's an important thing that hasn't been uh, touched on yet. Um, and I'm chair of that subcommittee, work with Senator Lee on this extensively, as well as Senator Grassley. Um, and I'm concerned that some of the for forced um, arbitrations are frustrating the purpose of our antitrust laws. 
uh, like I noted during our hearing on one of the hearings on the topic <clears throat> in 2019, uh, I was and still am disappointed uh, to see that the Supreme Court um, allowed American Express to force arbitration, even though doing so would make it difficult to enforce the law. In her dissent in the case, Justice Kagan wrote uh, that the forced arbitration provision in uh, the uh, employee's contract with American Express violated the Sherman Antitrust Act by depriving parties of a chance to challenge alleged monopolistic conduct. Meanwhile, large companies were able to negotiate uh, better fees or arbitration clauses that smaller companies uh, who are still forced into arbitration clauses. Um, you testified, uh, thank you, both in 2019 and in your testimony today uh, that forced arbitration interferes with antitrust and other laws. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you, Senator. I'm happy to. Um, at that hearing, you might remember Alan Carlson, uh, the chef owner of Italian Colors Restaurant, the named plaintiff in American Express versus Italian Colors, testified. I think, I mean, it was a striking piece of testimony. He, um, he told us that other companies, Walgreens, CVS, Safeway, were able to take American Express to trial because, of course, they have a tremendous amount of market power. Um, so American Express could not bind those large companies to forced arbitration clauses, whereas it did so for all small businesses, including his restaurant, which meant that he could not actually hold American Express responsible for, uh, for these antitrust, for, for the alleged antitrust violations. Um, and I think that, you know, when we think about small businesses, um, as you all do all the time, small businesses do a tremendous amount for this country. And one of the things they do is they enforce laws, just like consumers and workers do. And they are often at the front lines of enforcing antitrust laws because they are uh, often victims of antitrust violations of anti-competitive behavior, which is what that case was all about. Um, exactly. So, yeah. And as just we're seeing more consolidation uh, in such a big way, and we're seeing uh, issues, uh, as we all know, with the tech companies, unfortunately, we've been stagnant here about <laughs> changing those antitrust laws. We've gotten a number of bills through committee, and I appreciate the chairman's leadership on that. We have, um, they're all bipartisan, every single one of them. Um, but they're sitting there, and we were had one victory at the end of 2022 to get more funding for the agencies, given these huge uh, cases, especially uh, involving Facebook and Apple and Amazon and uh, Google. And we got that done. Senator Grassley and I did a change to the merger fees, um, which was estimated for this year about 50 million more dollars, less merger fees for small mergers, bigger mm -hmm. ones for big mergers. And then like, poof, we passed it 88 to 8 in an amendment, and then the money disappeared mm -hmm. under some rock in the federal government. And for the first time in 25 years, did not go to the antitrust division of the Department of Justice mm -hmm. um, after an attempt was made to delay them from getting the fees. What is this whole story about? It's a pretty outrageous story, which I've said, and I've been promised this is going to change in the future. But it's also about the importance of private enforcement of the antitrust laws. And I just want to make a case for that. But I do want to end with um, Ms. Carlson, um, who I've known for quite a while, um, and uh, just asking about um, what you said in your testimony, that the law we passed, and I thank my colleagues for their leadership, um, about ending forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment becoming law in December of 2022. Um, uh, you stated this law is already making a significant impact in the lives of countless survivors. Uh, can you describe in more detail the positive effects of this law? Yes, thank you so much, Senator Klobuchar, and always great to see you from our great state of Minnesota. Um, I mentioned Kirsten Tiger. She was a bartender at a prestigious country club who was harassed by multiple members, allegedly, as well as by a security guard there, allegedly. And uh, still employers are trying to force victims of sexual misconduct into arbitration because the onus is upon the employee to understand that this law has passed and that they do not have to go to arbitration. So I have not specifically spoken personally to Kirsten, but I speak to women every single day who say my, co my company's still trying to force me into arbitration and I say they can't do that anymore. Um, so Kirsten's is a case of that they went to a judge, um, her company filed a motion to compel arbitration and the judge denied it 
specifically because of this groundbreaking law that had passed. Um, a judge in Texas recently, uh, Blaze Media, tried to uh, get a motion to dismiss against one of their employees, Sidney Watson, who alleged harassment allegedly by her co-anchor um, over a span of time. And that was also denied because of the law. So what I have found over the last two years is that the biggest, the biggest and the most important thing after passing this law is to educate people about it because companies probably are not going to willingly tell you that you no longer have to be forced into arbitration for sexual misconduct. And this is why it's so important for me to, to pass the Protecting Older Americans Act as well, um, because it's my goal to be able to protect all human rights violations that happen at work, including Senator Booker's bill with regard to race discrimination and forced arbitration and, and any other protected class. After my experience at Fox News and what I had to go through, and respectfully, Mr. Schwartz, um, nobody would have ever known about my story if I had been forced into arbitration. Nobody. And we arguably would not be in the Me Too movement right now if that had happened to me. And so that, if that's not a compelling story enough to understand what happens with the secrecy of forced arbitration, I don't, I don't know what is. But it's time to do it for other people who are having their human rights violated at work and being shoved into secrecy. Thank you. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for being here today and uh, for this hearing. And Mr. Chairman, I'm so pleased that you mentioned the Ending Force Arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act. Um, that is something that Senator Gill and I, Gillibrand and I put a good bit of time into. It was a strong bipartisan effort, and it is something that was needed. Now, I uh, fully appreciate what it's like to be a female in a man's world. And I had great experiences, whether it was the Southwestern Company, the Kastner Knot Company, or people that I did contract work for. And I know not everybody has that. And so making certain that women were not going to be isolated and did have the ability to tell their story and to uh, achieve what they feel like is justice is something that is important. And of course, Ms. Carlson, we just thank you for the work you did on that bill mm -hmm. and also the Speak Out Act. Uh, the fact that those efforts have been invaluable. And um, I, I do think, though, as I sit here and I look at this issue, I agree with Senator Cotton that there is a place and a role for arbitration. And uh, as he went through his questioning with you all, I know that it has been used as a beneficial tool to, um, to be certain that you don't get trapped into lengthy and costly litigation. So I'm appreciative of that. And I have to say, as we look very carefully at this, I am not in favor of expanding um, this prohibition on arbitration beyond that unique context that we found with sexual assault and harassment. So um, while I'm glad that we prohibited forced arbitration agreements in those limited circumstances, I think we have to be very careful as we look at something that would expand these prohibitions. And I am so pleased that we have had the opportunity to hear from you all and to have this discussion today. And uh, Ms. Carlson, I agree with you that education to women when it comes to sexual harassment, education to employees, on that prohibition and uh, the opportunity that they have for that self-protection is something that's important. So thank you all for being here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. After the Supreme Court, um, Supreme Court's decisions that pretty much said, um, 
uh, arbitration clauses are okay and that the 1925 Federal Arbitration Act would be, um, would have the, have basically force, the force of law, which it was, but um, I, I'd like to ask, is it Professor Gillis? Is that how your name is pronounced? Yes? Yes, it is. Okay. So isn't it practically legal malpractice not to counsel your corporate clients to have arbitration clauses in their employment contracts to cover just about every dispute that could arise? I think so. I tell my students that. <laughs> I tell them if you go out into practice and you're working in big law, you should make sure you, get, you put in a forced arbitration clause. Obviously, that's a statement against interest, but I do believe that at this point, it's probably the best way for corporations to immunize themselves from all legal liabilities. And this is why we in Congress find ourselves uh, <laughs> describing certain kinds of, of complaints and allegations that should be treated differently and not have forced arbitration applicable to them, which I, I think is may, maybe not quite the way to go because there are, yes, in the, in the case of sexual assault, um, th these are instances where it is very difficult as we have heard from Ms. Carson, and thank you, Ms. Carson, for your advocacy and leadership to bring to light how difficult it is for people who experience sexual harassment, sexual assault in the workplace to come forward. And there are many other instances where it is very difficult uh, for, for people to come forward to lodge their complaints. So, uh, <laughs> Professor Gillis, do you or any of the uh, other uh, people on the panel, thank you all for testifying, do you have other instances where you think that forced arbitration clauses make it very difficult for uh, complainants to even come forward? For example, uh, in the instance of hate crimes within the workplace, if there's forced arbitration, there could be retaliation. There, there are various things that could happen. I led our effort to, uh, to pass the uh, COVID Hate Crimes Act two years ago, realizing that hate incidents are very difficult to be reported. So anyone want to, uh, to weigh in on other examples of behaviors where forced arbitration should not be applied? I will, Senator, thank you so much. I think it, that this boils down to the fact that people don't have the right to decide for themselves what's best for them. When you have forced arbitration, the decision's already been made for you, and the operative word is forced. If it's so great, why is it forced upon you? Every study shows that the majority of Americans, when they're explained, when they understand what arbitration is, they disagree with it because they want to be able to make the choice for themselves. Whether or not they choose mm -hmm. to seek accountability or not, they at least want to have that choice. And generally in the arbitration instances, it's in the uh, employment contract, who selects the arbitrators or the chair of the arbitration panel? Or however, who, who makes those decisions? The Anybody? company does, right? The company writes the rules, and they write the rules in a way that's most beneficial to them, which, of course, is what we should expect. Um, what if in, the, uh, in an arbitration situation that the law requires that the parties involved get to select their own arbitrators and possibly the arbitrators selected then select a chair? Would that make the process fairer? No, I don't think it would. Because the truth is that um, companies like the American Association for, Ar for Arbitration, uh, JAMS, these are the big platforms that provide arbitration services. Um, they have a sort of a stable of, of ex-judges and, and uh, ex-defense lawyers. Um, and these are people who, uh, even if I could, even if right now I could, you could give me a list of all of them, I wouldn't know who among them to choose. If I have a strike list and I can strike people off that list, as an individual, I don't know who to choose, whereas the company, as a repeat player, can knows exactly who the right arbitrators are to choose. So the power imbalance continues even if you have a system where there's choice, if we're going to call it that, among a group of basically um, corporate-minded uh, potential arbitrators. But I, I want to give you one example, Senator, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Flores, who is an NFL coach who was fired, 
Um, he tried to bring an arbitration along with a number of other NFL coaches who were fired alleging race discrimination. Um, and get this, this is not surprising, the NFL's um, arbitration clause says that the sole arbitrator is Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't imagine anyone who would be less likely to find for Brian Flores or any of these black coaches uh, than Roger Goodell. Not because I'm saying nothing bad about Roger Goodell, I've never met the man, but let's be honest, he basically works for the teams. So how could he possibly be unbiased in a case of race discrimination brought by uh, brought by former coaches. And I think it's essentially what we're seeing across the board. Do you think it's time to revisit the 1925 Federal Arbitration Act? Well, I think you did revisit it when you, went, when you uh, amended, uh, with Gretchen's help, um, amended mm. uh, the, the statute to add Ephesasha, um, which showed, by the way, that a 100-year-old statute can withstand some congressional tinkering. So I congratulate you for that. I think, I think you should. I think the FAIR Act uh, that Senator Blumenthal uh, has proposed would essentially uh, amend the statute to say that it does not apply to pre-dispute forced arbitration provisions imposed upon consumers, workers, and small businesses. Yes, yeah, so we've just been picking uh, different parts of behavior, so it's probably time to look at the whole statute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Thanks, for letting Senator. me go over. Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I'm just so grateful uh, uh, for this panel and for the conversation that has been had today. Um, I have always had this reverence for the American justice system, its ideals and its values. And I, it's unique, uh, the principles we put forward when you travel the world and see how the rights and protections that our founders believed in and this simple ideal that, that justice should be a place where it's balanced, where justice is blind. And what a lot of my career has been about, living in a low-income black and brown community, is seeing, I think, what Brian Stevenson once said, that unfortunately the reality is you get better justice in America if you are rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. And then comes the areas of employment law and seeing how the power of corporations has grown so dramatically. Um, I'm, I'm often stunned at the levels of lobbyists that are down here advocating and fighting uh, for things that will protect corporate power. But yet many of the people who are uh, workers are losing a lot of their uh, access to a balanced and a fair system. The work that's been done in this space has been e extraordinary. And Ms. Carlson, you are heroic in my office, uh, but more than that, um, you and the work that colleagues of mine have done uh, for what now has been two years, ending forced arbitration for sexual assault, has, has transformed the culture of our country. And I think that's really important, this idea of what actually changes cultures in workplaces, cultures that are toxic, cultures that are demeaning, cultures that are breaking laws, but more important, violating our values of human decency. And now that you've opened that up and been able to find ways, not just to get individual justice, but to expose these cultures to the light, to the disinfectant power of light is extraordinary. And so what might be justice for one person in a discrimination suit actually affects uh, millions of people in terms of what is a healthy culture. And all of the naysayers and the doomsayers who said that this was gonna uh, uh, result in uh, clogging up courts and, and exorbitant costs and dragging out disputes. This discussion is not true. Corporations will find it cheaper to create cultures that are uh, uh, nourishing and nurturing, not just to uh, their bottom line, but to the employees that there. It's far cheaper to go that direction and correcting those cultures and allowing them to continue. And so this to me has been really exciting to see this change. Uh, but Ms. Carlson, what has really made you, uh, uh, people in my office feel such gratitude, including myself, is the fact that you, you, you've said basically um, that you're not going to stop. I will not stop, you said, until we, re we achieve the same rights for workers who have, been fa who have faced discrimination based on race, age, disability, gender, and sexual orientation. In other words, forget all these lines, race, age, all, it's just justice. It's a matter of having justice. And um, the, the, Ms. Gillis was talking about uh, the, the examples of race discrimination that are so similar to the stories of discrimination in other areas. 
you know, uh, are stunning to me. And I could go through them. You brought up the NFL example. The stories I've heard from Tesla, for example, from black workers have been shocking, should shock everybody who believes in basic virtues and basic human decency. And so I just, Ms. Carlson, if you could just, uh, why is this so passionate for you, having achieved such an incredible change to still be in the trenches working to make sure it's affecting all workers? Thank you so much, Senator Booker. I believe because I don't, believe that forced arbitration was ever supposed to be used to adjudicate human rights violations. You know, it was for small business disputes, and it was to unclog the court systems. For, you know, if I knocked over my neighbor's fence and we're talking about 300 bucks, that's, you know, let's go to arbitration, right? Why should we clog the courts? But not when somebody's racially discriminated against, not when somebody's sexually assaulted at work or let go like Joanne because she happened to be seasoned, right? Um, and, and you brought up a really interesting point that I just also want to echo, which is part of my hope in passing such landmark legislation was that it would actually change the culture as well. And you know why that happens? Because the power pendulum is like this when you have forced arbitration. Here's the company and here's the employee. But if you give this person voice, and this person knows now, and so does this person, that you can't be forced into silence with forced arbitration. The behavior may also stop. And that, to me, is the most gratifying part of this whole experience, is knowing that we might actually start to change culture as well as changing laws. And I've said this before, and it's a very profound statement. Changing culture in the most hyper-political time of our generation is more difficult than passing bipartisan legislation. And Ms. Grace, I wanna end with a question with you, but Ms. Carlson, just to say to you, the stories of humiliation and, and real financial catastrophe that has happened from people who've been discriminated against is so agonizing to know that there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans that still dealing with this. And for us as a Senate to parse out, well, this time we'll deal with age, this time we'll deal with, as opposed to everything is astonishing to me. But Ms. Grace, I was hoping you can just end for a second and just say, what would it have meant to you uh, to have the choice to decide whether to go into arbitration or have your day in court? And I'll, I'll uh, when she finishes, I will yield. Well, first of all, I think that Having worked as long as I did in a particular field, you develop a real Could you trust. make sure your microphone is turned on in, in front of you? Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I think if, if you work in a field as long as I have in one field, you develop a trust in your corporation, in your organization, that they will do right by you because you've given your whole life to them. And when you find out that that's not the case, then I think I want to have a right to say to other older Americans, you gotta watch your own back. You gotta make sure that they're not gonna do the same thing to you that they have done to me. And that of, of, of just uh, blinding me, of not allowing me to speak. Because I think that I'm, that employees everywhere, older Americans that deserve the right to vote, they deserve the right to make their own, I'm sorry, to, um, to have their own um, representative or to give their voice. I can't do it because we're old, older. And we can't, um, honestly, we, we just can't um, do it ourselves. We need to have the help. That's when they act offer arbitration, and arbitration is just a means not to change anything, but to hide everything. It's, it's a form of secrecy to me that shouldn't have to exist in our country, because if there's fairness on behalf of the corporation to the employer and to the employee, as I've been faithful to them, why would they do that to me? They wouldn't. It, it would just be a more even, as Gretchen said, it would be an even play. But as, if we're down here and they just decide at their whim, we're gonna get rid of her for somebody younger, I can understand that they might think it's more efficient to have somebody that they can pay $25 to an hour instead of $38 an hour. 
but particularly in fields like nursing, you get what you pay for. And the older person often has the wisdom, the knowledge that a younger person can't possibly have yet. It takes years of experience to develop that. And what we know directly reflects to our patients and, and, and their safety and their health. So we affect a lot of things just as a nurse. And you're telling me that I'm just going to get rid of you because we have somebody younger, somebody that we know that we want to slide in here. And I don't have a voice to say, wait a minute, this isn't fair. And other people seem to know it's not fair. This is America. My parents were both World War II veterans. They taught me to work hard. They taught me everything about America was wonderful. My mother was an immigrant from Russia, Poland. So to say now that justice, the justice system can just tie our hands behind our back and are, we're not allowed to speak and they take our voice away, to me that's not America anymore. And I just want to see that come back. And if we can start as they started with sexual harassment, I think older Americans, they've given their lives for this country, for their community, for their corporations, and they deserve just to have an even playing field back. Thank you, Ms. Grace. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Carlson, it's good to see you. When did you first come before this committee? I don't know if I've ever testified actually before uh, this committee, I, I, but I've, I've talk to you about supporting my, my legislation. I have testified before House Judiciary before. Okay. Um, and how long ago was that? I believe I did it twice. I did it in person before COVID, and I did it virtually during COVID. I know it was some time. For some reason, I thought you came before our Senate Judiciary. but I Well, I've been you... here. I've been here waiting and watching for the Maybe votes. Maybe I've seen you here. Of but, course, yes. Um, I appreciate your tenacity, but, it, but it, it makes a point. I mean, you're still trying to accomplish what you set out to accomplish years ago, and there hasn't been any progress. So I'm wondering, Mr. Schwartz, um, for, I, I was here for the uh, uh, the video, and uh, I have to say that you know, for people making employment decisions, you need to know whether or not a firm uh, requires binding arbitration or not. Let that be. You, you may have a right to due process. You don't have a right to a certain employment contract because the employer gets to set the terms. I hate to set, put, make that in cold, hard terms, but that's the reality of it. Uh, but there have been abuses, particularly in, uh, I think, that uh, age and... Uh, and sexual misconduct are two good examples. So, Mr. Schwartz, how do we how do we not just have this hearing six years from now, but fall far short of getting rid of biting arbitration, which I believe is a is a useful tool and, and should be still allowed. So, how do we bridge the gap versus have this discussion and never quite have uh, you know? So one side wins, the other side loses. What are the experts thinking as a happy medium? Um, uh, and is there one, or is there just a camel's nose under the tent, you can't go that far? How, how can we release some of the pressure to right some of the obvious wrongs that have occurred under the current system, but fall far short of what many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to achieve? Well, fortunately, with regard to gag orders, state courts, and I think led by uh, the chairman of this committee, have ruled gag order is unconscionable and not enforceable. Mm -hmm. And the record should show that. Uh, and I think that's important. P people should be able to discuss the results of their arbitration if they disagree with them as a matter of uh, just basic free speech in our country. Uh, there are certain isolated areas, and I suggested what, to the chair and uh, ranking member that this committee consider regulatory matters to address the specific areas where there's a problem, which has been so uh, carefully advocated by Ms. Carlson, uh, so that you don't, I hate to use the, the throw the baby out with the bathwater, but uh, you don't get rid of, uh, <laughs> well, that's, I've, I think it's how important in this committee to try to contradict yourself at least once. Uh, but, <laughs> so that, that's what I've always tried to do. Uh, so uh, the, the hearings are the hearings. Follow-up. 
for our, so we don't just have the same hearing over and over again. Consider regulation of these uh, agreements because for the most part, they're helpful. They're cheaper, faster, and I know the litigation system, sir, and believe me, you don't want to get involved in it. It's delay, costly. So in many cases, it's the only alternative for somebody is arbitration, and it isn't cruel, but the committee, by looking carefully at the possibility of regulation, can avoid having the same hearing every three years and address these issues. Well, that's my point, because I, you know, I, I believe past is prologue, um, and unless there's some sort of a sea change here, you're always going to have to have bipartisan agreement on this, um, and that's why things are falling short, which is why Ms. Carlson's having to spend more time up in D.C. Uh, count me in as uh, one of the people who actually want to get to what I think is a fair treatment. I believe that there are a lot of merits to arbitration, and to throw them out would be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But there are also some very clearly, I mean, the one thing that I can say about the committee leadership, they bring forth very sympathetic cases. Um, and I get that. They're legit. How anyone could say uh, that that's an acceptable outcome is just, I, I mean, I guess somebody could. I couldn't. But I, I don't like, uh, I've got a few skills. One of them is a good memory. And all we're doing is covering ground that we've covered before. Thank you all for your preparation. I would like to actually find some way that we make progress so that Ms. Carlson can go do other things <laughs> rather than have to spend time up here unless she wants to come up here and report on it again. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Schwartz, we'll, we'll reach out to you, but I, I really do want to be a part of uh, a group that actually makes progress that, that provides, um, I think, uh, some answer for the egregious examples that have been exhibited here in the committee prep materials. But not this just be a sea change in the way uh, businesses use arbitration appropriately far more often uh, than situations that are being discussed today. So thank you all for being here. I'd be pleased to help. I said earlier, lots of times when I'm here, it's a client money, but I'm not testifying by, by any client, not being paid. Uh, and I'd be, I'm in a stage in life where I would like to be a little bit more helpful than I Well, we'd like to tap on your expertise. As long as you're not going to bill me for it, we will. We wouldn't, yeah. Thank that, you. That would be unfair <laughs> at your salary. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to, to all of the witnesses here. Um, there's been so much here that, sort of has, that really has grabbed uh, my both imagination uh, source of incredible frustration, um, but also uh, tapped into a number of experiences that I've had across uh, my career. Uh, Professor Gillis, it's such a uh, pleasure to hear you use the phrase uh, collective action. Um, as someone who spent 20 years in the, in the labor movement, another tool um, that we have uh, to give voice uh, to, to workers is that of unionization. And in the space of unionization, we, there also is an arbitration process. Um, it's an, there's an arbitration pro process that uh, gives voice, uh, Ms. Carlson, to, to the point that you made, that equalizes um, the, the voices and power of employers and employees through their chosen uh, organization or representative uh, or, or union. And, you know, every experience of, of union arbitration that, that I've had, there was a jointly chosen panel, not a association that gave you a set of names to consider. Uh, every instance that a worker, uh, a worker's grievance or case went through to arbitration, uh, the, the uh, union and the employer had to agree on who was going to be uh, the arbitrator or panel of, of arbitrators. Everyone had strike uh, ability to eliminate a name uh, from that mutually chosen list. So I do believe that there is a framework here in, uh, in terms of how uh, we can utilize the and ben get the best benefits from, uh, from our arbitration. Uh, and we just have to look to some of the models that we have created. I am not here to say that, uh, that, that unionization is the only answer, but there is, a, there we are, we do have models of fairness um, that we can, can call upon. Ms. Carlson, it struck me in your written testimony, your re uh, reference to Tesla workers um, who 
have been, uh, and a number of my colleagues uh, have been working to support uh, their unionization, their choice that they are uh, making to, to uh, choose to form a union there at Tesla. And we all know that there are certain categories of workers that today uh, our labor laws don't allow uh, to, to unionize. So I, it, as I was listening and reading the, the testimony, one of the things that I was curious about is, has been referenced here. You have been relentless. You have committed uh, that you are, are not uh, going to gonna quit. What are some, there are, there are the category of workers that have available to them the tool of unionization. Um, there's the category of workers who by, by, only by antiquated laws um, are traditionally excluded. What are some of the recommended um, uh, uh, evolved tools, new tools, contemporary tools um, that you would suggest that this committee, this Senate, uh, really take up to advance the protection of human rights that you're so dedicated to? Yes, so my strategy has been to try and take a bite out of the apple for each protected class because, uh, as Senator Tillis mentioned, it has to be bipartisan, and it should be bipartisan because we're talking about human rights violations. Um, so that has been the strategy. It's why I'm now moving forward with the Protecting Older Americans Act, and I support Senator Booker's uh, bill as well about race discrimination and forced arbitration. But for me, giving workers choice and not being forced into arbitration is what this is all about. You suddenly give them the option of being able to have a voice. And trust me, a lot of them will not choose to speak it. Because I can tell you from personal experience, it ain't fun to come forward. Yeah. And as the professor has also spoken about this morning, it is very hard to prove your case. And so most of these cases are extremely relevant and sound if they actually get to court. And so that disproves the notion that we were going to suddenly have a, a flurry of cases when the, the ending arbit forced arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment act. Um, I need to get the, the monogram or the um, acronym from you. Yeah. What do you call it? <laughs> OK. That's even harder. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a mouthful. So, that's why I keep coming back to, if you give workers choice and their own liberty to make their own decisions, uh, that to me is the fairest way to do this. And make, if you wanna make arbitration an option, which it still is under the law, um, then they can choose it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. One last question, Mr. Chair, if I, if I could. Uh, Professor Gillis, you um, talked a lot in your testimony about how forced arbitration exacerbates uh, economic inequality in the country. Um, another uh, gift of the labor movement and unionization is, pay, is uh, greater pay equity. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems that in this space of forced arbitration, uh, we continue to see those sort of, uh, at least according to the data that, that, you prov that you made reference to, greater economic inequality uh, uh, in, the, in the space. And so I'm curious, I just wanted to ask, this is a really a question out of curiosity. I'm curious, is, the, is there any uh, further information or greater detail that you can reveal for us about what the data shows relative to forced arbitration, particularly on women workers mm -hmm. um, and workers of color, just to try to pair the two, the, the conversation or the um, response that Ms. Carlson just gave? Of course, uh, and I appreciate the question. Uh, obviously, more data is always better, so we should do more studies. But the studies show us that uh, women and minorities tend to work in fields where forced arbitration is employed far more often than other fields. So, so that's one good bit of evidence. Um, I think we also have to take a sort of historical view, and there have been some studies that take a kind of a historical view um, and the truth is that women and minorities are um, the least likely to bring claims in court, even before forced arbitration, right? The fear of retaliation, uh, the intimidation that comes with being uh, the person who's bringing the claim have often silenced women and minorities. Um, and then I think we just have to be aware that, you know, poor people in this country they bump into the corners of our law in all sorts of ways. Uh, and those are sharp corners. And they don't necessarily know who to go to, um, how to get representation, 
how to get advice. And so many times they just end up lumping it, right? They can't afford to quit the job um, and find something else. And even if they did quit the job and find something else, everybody's doing it, mom, right? Everybody's forcing you into arbitration. So I do think that, and I wrote this in my testimony, I, I mean, you know, for those of us who are really concerned about the, the, the rising levels of inequality, forced arbitration is just one additional tool that enables that chasm to continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. I listened to the defense of forced arbitration, and what I heard was, I wrote down the words, it's easier, it's cheaper, it's faster, just as fair as a court. So if that's all true, why is it forced? If the employee or the person who's aggrieved thinks it's such a good idea, why don't you just make it an option? Go ahead and pick arbitration if you like, but basically we're not gonna take away your constitutional right under the Seventh Amendment. It's your right as a citizen of the United States. So the argument about arbitration being a much better outcome, maybe in some cases, I don't know. But by and large, that decision should be made by the aggrieved party, by the worker, by the citizen. I think that's so fundamental and so basic. Gretchen Carlson, thanks for coming back in an official capacity. Professor Gillis, Professor Schwartz, and especially Ms. Grace, thanks for telling your story. You're going Thank to inspire us to have another hearing, maybe a markup pretty soon, maybe even a federal law. <clears throat> maybe you'll join Ms. Carlson and be able to point to something that changed America because you took the time to speak up and stand up. You might get some written questions from members of the committee. If you do, please return them as quickly as you can. This meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr.